for George, I think it was extremely liberating to have something like skateboarding where it gave him you know, the vessel to explore the world in a different way, in a very physical way. You just, you look at the world as kind of a playground for yourself. Even like with the world, how it exists as it is right now, he still wanted to like shape it a little differently into something that would be more interesting for him, which is why he would go out and build ramps. Or like <coughs> when, when he was still working at uh, Sailor and they were re redesigning the park, um, you know, like for him, that was an opportunity to like create it completely different world he built a skate park a giant skate park and it was awesome he gave back to the community that way by building a skate park for kids and making it better and he took time after not even ever working with wood in his life he made sure that this community always had something to skate buy either buy boards from or have a park to skate if he had say so in it it was good for all of us not just him that's just who he was it was, uh, it was pretty amazing. Like, like, you could go to George with anything, and he would find a way to help you with that. He would go out of his way to, like, try to put out positive vibes all the time, and he was just relentless at always doing that. So, like, anything that he could be a part of, skate lessons or, you know, tutoring or, like, whatever, you know, he just... He's about helping people, making making the best out of everything. So. He's like a perfect model of like a human being of like what you should do. Always motivated, always positive. He, he's really good at trying to push you to be a better person. And I really liked being around that. George was born December 11th, 88. So yeah, I would have been one at the time. When we were in Seattle. I think we moved to Pullman the following year. It's like Georgie, <clears throat> I think he looked for um, a lot more, he, he tried to build relationships a lot outside of the family. So he was really dependent on doing things separately. He was kind of rambunctious, just kind of going off doing his own thing. Um, I have one, ex one memory of us like pretending like we're driving cars inside our apartment. And that's when we learned to like stick keys into the electrical socket. So <laughs> we were pretending he was a driver. And then I was like, all right, you got to start the car. And he'd like put the key in and thing exploded and his hands all blackened from it. So I don't remember him really being hurt. It was just like very, sh <laughs> it was shocking. But yeah, it was just like, it was, it was super surprising. And then that was it. And then we just go off and do something else. Um, I think we all, like, so there's three of us, Georgie, Mari, and me, and I think we all learned to be pretty independent early on. Um, Georgie ran away a couple times, actually, uh, like, just for a day. We just, like, ran across the street to the babysitter's house and thought, like, he would start a new life or something, I don't know, <laughs> but it, but then uh, we would always end up finding out where he is, and then he would come back. This was probably, like, right after our dad left, so he must have been, like, six or seven at the time, maybe five. But I kind of got the impression that he normalized it pretty quickly. Um, our dad was very playful, though, with all of us, so I think he was definitely missing out on the company of our dad. which is probably, might be one of the reasons why Georgie was looking for a lot more outside of the family, trying to you know, play with other people more often and hanging out, just doing his own thing, so. And he never really cared for kind of like the usual things that most kids are expected to do with like school and careers and things like that. So he's very independent figuring out what he wanted to do. He started skating, what? I think that was in middle school as well. He was, uh, you know, he started off with like really cheap Walmart boards and then nothing like really legit until he started going to the skate park and seeing how like you know, 
cool kids that were actually doing things. This was back in Portland. So I imagine it was just like him and his friends, like maybe saw a few videos and they were just like curious and then try to get into it. That would be my best guess. I think he moved here from Pullman with his family. Uh, Steve and his mom and his brother and his sister, Josh and Mari, Josh and Marie. Um, there was a new kid in town that skated and that was very, very rare names after we first got our skate park. It was most mostly just locals, you know. I mean, we were all we were all just local kids. We've all grown up here. I was at my mom's house, and she lives on Ridgewood, which is right down the street from high school. And I would get out of school earlier because I was in middle school at the time, and I'd just like see him skate. Or I'd actually I never even saw him. I'd just like hear him skate past my house every day going to the skate park. I'm like, she's so fucking skating to the skate park, and then like. One day, like, I was outside, like, chilling out front, and I see him skating down the street from the high school. And I was like, no way, it's that fucking Georgie kid. And he's, like, wearing his, like, yellow hoodie and his, like, blue pants like he always used to wear back in the day. And I was just like, dude, come on, man, let's, like, you go to the skate park? What are you doing? Like, let's go to the skate park together. And... Me and him, like, just fucking, that, that was, it. like, that was, like, how we, like, just, like, we're like, oh, yeah, I guess we're friends now, like, it's just me being, like, yeah, let's go to the skate park together. Georgia was one of those guys that, like, even though you weren't very good at it, he wanted to, like, congratulate you and, like, get you stoked on the smallest things that you did, like, I don't know, he's just very personable, and it was, like, especially, like, being, like, overwhelmed by how good everybody else was, you were just, like, I love this dude. Like, he just got me jacked on the little things, so. But, uh, he came in just, for, you know, the first day was pretty quiet, but I remember going up to him. I'm one of the most talkative ones of all of us. And they, everyone would say it. But, uh, when I saw him, you know, I just introduced myself. And my first time seeing him, skate park, yellow S hoodie, big Gazelle Pluses. And he just, uh, I mean, he was weird. It was, he was quiet, but. I didn't let it be quiet for very long like I always do. I always just kind of went up to him. I was like, Wah! you know, he's just like, George. And, like, I, we, like, skated there, and I showed him, like, some crazy route because he was, like, skating, like, the the normal way. <laughs> and I, like, showed him, like, the backwoods way, how to go cut through, like, the park. It was pretty funny. There's, like, this dirt hill that you can skate down. It's, like, hard enough, but there's, like there's roots and stuff coming up from up the ground and all that and so like you have to like kind of like you know like shimmy your way over all this stuff as you're going down like trying to stay stable and like dude he ate so much shit he tried falling behind me which i was so stoked <laughs> he just ate so much shit like right at the bottom but he dude that that like got him sparked and like I just heard about it for like the next like weeks like you're like dude I've been taking that route <laughs> it's like I'm so close to getting to the bottle without falling <laughs> but like eventually he was like yeah dude I totally fucking got that route today <laughs> like, and I was just like hell yeah dude that's so sick like you're gonna be fucking so good at skating like why are you rolling down hills <laughs> but yeah, no, that was, that was, like, the first time that me and him, like, actually became friends, I feel like. Like Adam and I said, he's a little bit younger than us. Um, I think it was just at the skate park, and it was pretty apparent, like, being one of the older guys, like, oh, like, who's, who's this kid? And just kept showing up just as often as all, the, like, the rest of us, and, like, it was a daily thing. And you could tell he wasn't, like, super seasoned when he showed up, but he definitely progressed quickly um, and always had a good attitude. Like, that, that place brought a lot of people together, I think, and it was, it was awesome for him to be one of them. More than likely what ended up happening is I was probably filming, and um, he was you know, trying a trick, and he's like, hey, man, let's get this on film, let's try it, you know? And I think that is pretty much the basis for a lot of my friendships within skateboarding, within this community here in Ames anyways, 
is uh, it all kind of started with the skateboard. And then for me, it, it kind of um, took on another aspect, which was videography or photography. So, yeah. I think he started school when I was a sophomore and like he was also a sophomore and he was the new kid. And I definitely have this memory where like, uh, like, I don't know whose idea it was, but it was, it was not cool. Like he wanted to like sit with the people who skated or whatever at lunch. And we like had this plan where it was like, okay, when Georgie gets to the table, let's all just get up and walk away. And like, we did that multiple times and it was so mean. <laughs> I didn't even know who he was, but we're sitting here playing this joke on this dude. I didn't, I didn't even know. And so I was like, well, I'm just going to do it. Cause I like you guys, but we offended him. And after that, I was like, well, I'm not going to be a dick to this kid anymore. And we became best friends pretty quick. It didn't matter like what you did as long as you were like trying to go out there and do whatever you loved, he supported it. So like artists, musicians, which is also art, but like, you know, skateboarding kids, especially like any kid trying to do anything. Like if he could find some means to like connect with them, he would go out of his way to like talk to them and like, you know, get them excited. And that was something I never even like understood how to do for myself. Like, I mean, just, Put yourself out there and like you know try to try to put out positive vibes all the time and he was just relentless at always doing that so like, like anything that he could be a part of skate lessons or you know tutoring or like whatever you know he's just he's about helping people making making the best out of everything so uh i met george probably sometime i think i was like third or fourth grade you know just a, a little kid with a Walmart skateboard, right? Rolling out to the park and getting in everybody's way. <laughs> Just a regular little wiener kid. That's it. So, from my point of view, with him being younger, um, he was kind of a kid that, like, some of us older guys were like, you're cool, we got you, like, you're with us. Um, but, again, just his attitude and his willingness to be very personable to anybody. Like, it didn't matter how old or young you were, like, what your background was. It didn't matter. Like, if you skated, like, he was down to talk to you and, like, treat you as an equal. It wasn't until, like, I think fifth grade. It was just me and George skating at the park. It, there weren't any lights yet. Um, it was sundown, and I was probably skating something I probably shouldn't have been. And, uh... I guess, well, I fractured my ankle. I didn't necessarily break it. I didn't have to wear a cast or anything. But George was the only person there. Thank God for that, man. Because uh, if it wasn't for George, I probably really wouldn't have been able to make it home, really. He uh, he called his stepdad at the time. Uh, I think his name was Steve. Uh, and then... He came in, got us, took me home, and then my uh, my mom and my sister took me to the hospital. But like that's at that point, that's when I I guess became friends with George. And then you know after after my ankle healed and I came back to the park, we you know started talking and skating together and whatnot. And then that was kind of you know after I started getting a little better. Uh, probably like summer between sixth and seventh grade that that's when I finally had the privilege of becoming one of them. He was the motivator, whether or not he was on the board or off the board. He was the hype guy. He was always just light lighting a fire under your ass, you know? You you could get him to try any trick. He was like Hey, I'll buy you a Jimmy Jones sandwich, or hey, uh, I'll buy you coffee, or you know, I got lunch. He would just try anything. We could, one day we tried to get him to big flip the four, and he landed on it first try, and he just kept landing on it and slipping out, like belly flopping, essentially, just boom, and he wouldn't give up. He, it's like we only told him to try it once, but then he wouldn't stop trying it. <laughs> it was so funny, and he just kept slamming. He would try anything you'd ask him to do, or you could talk him into trying anything. You know, to be around someone like that, 
to have a person like that in your community, in your group of friends, that is huge. You know, if, if you're struggling, if you're down, if you're not feeling like you want to commit to something and you have that one person there that's always got your back, it's always just, you know, building you up to be a better person, to be like, you got this, this try. You know, that is, <laughs> that is such a huge part of what community means to me. It's like each one of us can contribute something to a collective group. What he brought was just energy, you know, pure raw energy. Anytime he would skate a rail, he was a normal dude. Like he wasn't a robot skater. Like he definitely had the opportunity to meet the cement very personally many times because he was willing to push that envelope so much. Like you're going to pay at that point. Like yeah. if you're really pushing it, like, and he did and he never gave up because of it. Because all this scar tissue had developed on his, not only his elbows, but his hands, he went through this phase where he like, every time he'd bail a trick, he couldn't like roll because his elbows were so gnarly and mashed up. He couldn't like put his hands down because they were so destroyed that he would fall on his chest. And then he would just like, he would make this, uh, this uh, noise. And it was just so bad. It was so brutal, man. It was just like, he was, he, you know, I think he had sort of developed a reputation of being committed and throwing himself at whatever he's trying, you know, being willing to sacrifice and to, you know, be there filming him, trying those tricks when he was at that point where he was so injured that he just had to fall on the concrete on his chest and you heard it. That was something that I kind of missed. That was like, I don't ever want to see my friends fall or get hurt, obviously. Nothing like that. But to see that level of dedication, that level of commitment, that level of sacrifice, I miss that, man. I remember like getting these gnarly ingrown toenails or, I mean, these bruises on my feet because I would try to kickflip Big Four or Ollie and I would bail and I'd land. My toes would just jam into the front of my shoes and I didn't know why my toenails hurt so bad and I'm like because my feet are just moving around in these shoes they didn't even fit me and I remember putting my one day when he brought up that he thinks we're wearing suit shoes too big I'm like what and I like went down and I put my thumb and it was an inch and I'm like you're fucking right I wear a seven and a half and so since then me Georgie and Jeff Luang would always pass shoes down to each other they'd start with Georgie they'd go to Jeff and then I would buy them for 15 bucks after they had already rocked them and then I mean for years I didn't even have new shoes because I was fucking poor and I would just use their hand-me-downs and to this day I'm still getting them from Jeff and we're still seven and a half <laughs> so we were we were off we were we were far off our size we just love the shoes I guess I don't know you know, we were in high school together. He, um, he had a Spanish teacher, Mrs. Quintero. And uh, one day after class, she um, took him aside after everybody else had left and was like, Georgie, I need to talk to you. You know, and he's like, whoa, you know, what's going on? Because she's very serious. She's got this whole demeanor that's just like, you know, there's something going on. So... Like, yeah, you know, what? what's up? And she's like, Georgie, I think we need to talk about what's going on at home. And he's like, it's really confusing. And he's like, what do you mean? Like, and she goes, well, Georgie, look at your arms. Like, you're, you know, what's going on at home? Are you being abused? And he goes on to just, like, laugh. And he's just like, look, I skateboard. I fall a lot. Because his arms were so bruised and bloody and scabbed up. And, you know, he's just like, this is just, this is what I love to do. You know, there's nothing like home's good. <laughs> like, and she would still just like press it and just be like, are you sure? Like, I'm always here if you need to talk to me about anything, which is like, I love that. That's great. We need that from teachers to be looking out, obviously. But like, she, she just didn't understand it. You know, like a lot of people don't seem to, I think on the outside looking in at skateboarding, they don't, they don't see that. Um, that level of sacrifice, you know? It's like Georgie, <clears throat> I think he looked for um, a lot more, he, he tried to build relationships a lot outside of the family. So he was really dependent on doing things separately. He was frustrated a lot because being in the middle 
old, or the, the middle child, recognizing that you might kind of be the dark horse a little bit, you know, he really felt misunderstood a lot of the time um, because of just the fact that he was a skateboarder and his, you know, his, his mom at least didn't really seem to, I won't say that she didn't appreciate it. At that time, she just didn't fully understand it. You know, she didn't understand the potential within it, where it can take you, the things that it can lead you to in your life. He put everything he had, <clears throat> excuse me, not only into his skating, but building a community of skateboarders and putting himself in the position to not segregate anybody from it, regardless of how good you were or what, like, again, your background or anything. Like, there was never any judgment. It was just like, I love this. You love this. Let's talk about it. Can't really express who he was because, like, he is such a special person. Like, anybody could come to him and, like, have some type of, like, feeling of, like, I, like, had this line of fate and God put me in, like, like, this position to, like, speak to this man and, like, this person enlightened me. Like, he was kind of like that, like, like a modern day, like, Jesus or something. <laughs> like, that's how I feel about it. Like, he just touched everyone's hearts. And he's also, like, a little demon inside himself, too, where he, like, he did some little fucked up shit that was, like, funny as heck, but it was, like, always, like, positive. It wasn't, like, just, like, what other people get off on. We had a few drinks. We felt like being rowdy. Stole the hot dogs that they used to give away free on Tuesdays at Mickey's, the Irish pub. And we just filled up a bag full of these cooked hot dogs and went around putting them on random things. Like, he, he climbed up on the back of a BMW and spiraled this hot dog onto their little antenna on the back window. And his little Asian ass up there is the funniest thing I've ever seen. It's like he climbed up a sign and put one on a stop sign. And two years later, it was still there, just like degrading, running down the sign. <laughs> like, gross. But it was hilarious because he he's not somebody that would ever do that. But like get him in the right light sometimes the right mood and he would uh, get a little wild so it's fun these kids we used to hang out with they uh they egg georgie's car and he's got so pissed and i was just like just no big deal screw those guys and he's like no we're gonna get those guys <laughs> and so like they're all like hanging out their parents house the parents are gone they're like chilling in the living room and here it's like sneaking outside their house like spy on I'm like dude what are we doing like it's like no dude I got this idea just follow me <laughs> and so like we we snuck into their house and like he had me just like watching and like keeping out look and meanwhile he's like going down to the basement to like this kid's room and he's just grabbing all of his shit. And he, he was taking out the back door. I didn't even know he was doing this. And like, I don't even know how he did it. it like, it was like five, ten minutes max. And like, he had literally everything in the kid's room, even his bed, out inside his front lawn. <laughs> and he just grabs me. He's like, come on, let's go, let's go. And we're leaving. I'm just like, what? Dude, what did you do? Like, all, all of this stuff is just chilling on his lawn. And he's just like, I know, this is fucking awesome. <laughs> we just got in the car and, like, peeled off, like, letting them know that we were there. <laughs> it was such good shit. He was, yeah, he had that little, like, shenanigans to him that made him, like, such an awesome person to be around. Like, go, like, fix skate spots up and... It was just, like, the gnarliest things ever. Like, just, like, dude, we're totally going to get busted. Cops are going to be, like, asking us who we are and, like, where our parents live and all this stuff. And, like, he's just like, dude, no, we're doing this. Like, come on. <laughs> we got to do this. We got to make skate spots in the Aves. No one else is going to. <laughs> it was just always, like, crazy stuff like that. 
He's always wanted a shop because we couldn't keep one in town. All the shops that we did have closed there. I mean, one of them was a fucking Hobby Lobby. Like, it was Hobby Lobby. You go buy trains in cardboard airplanes and, like, remote-controlled trains and shit. They had skateboards in there because we had, it was a hobby store. That's where we bought our boards, Hobby Lobby. And Jordy's like, we need to fucking get our boards somewhere else other than Hobby Lobby. And Subsec moved names and they closed, so we didn't have a shop. And Jordy's like, we need a shop. Him and Chris Perkins tried to start one. It opened for a couple weeks and it was in a dark basement where now is the Vinyl Cafe here in Ames. And that was the first shop. You know, by the time we're uh, seniors, um, you know, 17, 18 years old, um, to have him pursue um, a business license, to have him open up a physical location of an actual skate shop um, at that age, and you know, I didn't know anybody that was doing anything like that at that time. He told me, it was like his grandma loaned him $500 so he could start the shop. He started it while he was in high school, which was, it was crazy. It was like, how many high school students started a business while they were still going to school? It's pretty amazing to see from my standpoint, because growing up and watching him come into town not knowing anyone, to having his own skate shop three years later, to hiring our best friends, Ryan Shalou, Waffles, Jeff Loy, um, they all had jobs there. And he was giving us all boards. If we couldn't afford one, he'd let us get one on spot and we'd pay him 20 bucks here and there until we could pay it off. I mean, I remember once having a $250 tab and I was like, sorry. And I paid him off and it was like, I didn't even realize like that's how giving he was, you know? And it wasn't, it wasn't for money. It was for all of us to keep skating and keep having the gear and just it kept the drive and the thrive there. I mean, it truly did. So he was there for everyone, not just himself. Ever, ever. It was awesome. Like, I think he was able to somehow get that business license even before he was 18. That's, again, just how driven he was to, you know, follow through with his dreams. So, um, I mean, as far as what he contributed to maybe the Ames community or the skate community, in a sense, you know, obviously just having a, a physical... Um, business, a location where, you know, you could get product, you could get your boards, wheels, whatever. He was the only 18 year old kid in his last senior year in high school who worked full time at the Flame and Skier. He was a server. He worked every single night. He had, he was going to school and he had a skate shop. He had a skate shop. He was paying rent on his own business at 19 years old. So, I mean, that alone, you're selling skateboards back to the community. People are buying from me. So even at a young age of 18, he was doing everything he could to get a skate shop back in this town after we've had failed attempts of them. He made sure we had one, and he kept it here. As long as he was in this town, we had a shop. And, we, and every time he wasn't here, it went away. You know, it's like Georgie kept a shop here. He kept kids buying boards locally in this town. Like, yeah, we don't mind driving to Subsec to buy boards. We don't like, we don't mind doing that because we have to. That's what keeps us going. But he made that, we didn't have to do that. He put a shop here in this town and he did it for us. He didn't make money off of it. He made enough to keep going. And he made just enough to pay rent for years. He could have closed down whenever. He thought he was gonna make a lot of money at first. And he's like, you know what, at the end of the day, I know I'm not gonna make a bunch of money, but we have a shop. We could all go hang out there when it was raining and watch skate videos. We took this road trip after we graduated high school in 2007. Um, man, at that point to you know not have smartphones, to basically just have your person in the passenger seat saying, all right, you know, here's the map. This is where we're going. We're gonna try and figure it out and it's gonna be great. You now we packed four of us. It was me, Tony, Grant, and Georgie. Uh, we packed all four of us in his little Honda Civic hatchback and we took off across the country. We were going to Washington State and we were going to stop in Denver um, along the way to skate the park there and then make our way north, northwest, to get up to Washington, which is where um, he was from originally. So we were going to his hometown. So um, along the way, it was like a two-week trip. So I think we had a total of... Um, three flat tires, we had 
over $260 in parking tickets. We almost got arrested. Um, so, I mean, this was the most epic road trip ever. So I guess like we get to Denver, everything's good. We skate to park, stay there, head out the next day, go north into Wyoming, blizzard, interstate shut down. We have to backtrack, take a completely different route than what we had originally planned. And all the while, it's like, you know, four kids from Iowa that have pretty much never really seen the mountains, never really been in that environment before, you know, first real major road trip where it's just us, no parents, no nothing, just relying on our own intuitive nature to, to navigate and survive. So um, eventually we make it up to Washington. And then I think, you know, first flat tire happened while we were there. Got it fixed, not a big deal. Um, we're skating spots the whole time. We're just kind of, you know, reliving or revisiting, I should say, a lot of the places that were just super important to him um, growing up skating there, you know, like the, uh, the Washington State University campus. And then also um, just across the border in uh, Moscow, Idaho, we go over there and skate too. Um, but then I guess when we almost got arrested, I take that back. So there was two times we almost got arrested on that trip. So the first one was where um, we went to, um, it was basically a state park and we did a little hike up to a scenic overlook. And, you know, we ignored the signs on the way in that said that the park closes at sundown. So we're up there, we're watching the sunset. Everything's great. We walk back down and we're thinking, all right, yeah, let's get a fire going. We're going to start grilling out, you know, and just hang out for a while. As soon as we get the campfire going, we get the grill set up, we're spotlighted and we just freeze and we hear this voice behind the spotlight go, all four of you get up here right now. And we're just like, okay, we start trudging up the hill, we get to the parking lot, we're standing there and it's a, it's like a park ranger, you know, he's just in his truck and he's blinding us with this floodlight. He's like, get back in the car and, you know, put your hands where I can see them. So we're all freaked out. We're like, okay, all right, we're doing it. We're getting in the car. And then he just goes on to take all of our IDs and go on this total power trip about, I mean, we didn't obviously realize the severity of what we were doing or the potential risk that was involved with, within that situation. But there was a lot of risk actually, because you know, mountain lions and bobcats, those are all over out there. Like there's a reason why these parks close and are locked down and shut down after after dark. So, you know, he really just tore into us about that. And, uh, you know, we were just like, we're so sorry. We're obviously just from Iowa, we're on a road trip. We don't know what's going on. We just um, begged and pleaded for mercy, mercy and he let us go. So it was cool, it's not a big deal. Um, then I guess this, the second time we got arrested, well, you know, skate trips pretty much done. We're driving home. Uh, let's see. Second flat tire was maybe about eight hours after we left, uh, Washington. So at that point we are running on, um, yeah, spare in the back. We're kind of out of options at that point. So. Uh, realizing that we're limping along, we're going. Um, then we get our third flat tire. It's like two in the morning. We're in the middle of Wyoming, middle of nowhere. And so, you know, he's, he's calling his, Georgie's calling his mom. We're all calling our parents. We're trying to figure this out. You know, AAA wouldn't tow us any farther. Um, we're stranded. So uh, we ended up at a tire shop the middle of Wyoming that didn't have a tire that would fit our car. We slept in the parking lot there, all four of us. Um, eventually we got towed out of there through some miracle. Uh, we ended up at a gas station for 18 hours. Then what ended up happening is that, you know, we decided we were done with this. We wanted to just get out of there. We were kind of just desperate. So I'm looking out in the parking lot. I kind of know cars and I'm like, okay, that car over there that has a spare in it that will fit this car. And so my other buddy, Grant, he goes over there. He looks at it. He's like, yeah, there's actually two spare tires in the back hatch of that car. So he goes over there, grabs one of them and brings it over to our car. And we proceed to swap it out so we can get going. Uh, it's probably like Five minutes after he started doing that, a sheriff rolled up and he, you know, was just like, hey, stop what you're doing. The 
um, gas station attendants, they've been watching us the whole time. So everything happened. So that was just another moment where we begged and pleaded for forgiveness. The owner of the car was someone who actually worked at the gas station, didn't want to press charges. So we were just like, all right, we're not getting arrested. That's great. We're still stranded. So um, then I guess as we're like kind of saying goodbyes to the sheriff and just being like, well, fuck, what do we do now? It's like this guy had overheard us talking to the sheriff about how we're stranded. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to go back to my house. I think I've got a rim and tire that's going to fit on there. So sure enough, this guy drives a half hour out of his way back to his house, half hour back to us, gives us a rim and tire to put on the car. We get going, we go back to his place and we hang out with him. Super cool guy. It's pretty amazing actually. And, uh, then yeah, we got back on the road. We finally made it home. It was just so epic. It was so epic, man. It was just like obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. But just knowing that it doesn't matter what happens. You're with your friends. It's an adventure. It's a journey. You know, it's just exciting the whole way. So, even like at parties, like you'd be like the guy over in the corner, like, look, man, you don't need to beat your girlfriend. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like talking. Like, there was one time I went to this party, and these kids were just like calling their friend like names and shit. And he's like this tiny little Asian kid, like going up against these tall ass jocks. He was like, dude, fuck off, dude. Stop calling your friend that. He's your fucking friend. Like, treat him with respect. Like, <laughs> and these kids got so pissed, and they were like fucking chasing us and stuff. And we were just, we just thought it was funny because we're like, we're gonna get away with this. But like, <laughs> G Georgie was like totally gonna get his ass kicked if we weren't like, all right, let's go. <laughs> but like, he was listening. You know, he's like, stood up for that kid. It's like. He was always doing shit like that. Like We were always out doing something. We were always just doing something because of him. He was just driven. It was crazy. At 17, 18, he was just the man. And then going into his 20s, he was just the man. It was crazy. He just did so much all the time. He was so busy. I was at Mods working, and he called me four days, and he goes, I'm going to San Diego this week. I got a job at Fox. I'm not going without you or Josh. I, I need someone with me and I want you there. And I'm like, dude, I can't go. And then uh, three days later, we're all going. It's, it's me and George at this point. And I have $20. I have $20. And um, he was like, hey, I'm going, I'm going tomorrow. Are you coming? And I'm like, dude, I don't know. I can't do that. And then Josh wasn't even on board yet. Josh was at the skate park. We all met at the skate park. Uh, we see Josh Kelly and Jordy's like, Hey, I'm going to San Diego tomorrow to move to like live my dreams and skating. And Josh went home, told his mom he's on board. And then Georgie calls me again and goes, Hey, Josh is on board. Are you coming with me or not? And I'm like, all right, yeah, I'll go with you. I'll leave tomorrow. And we ended up buying a hitch from the trailer store right outside by, um, Hawk Hawk. There's like this building there and we bought this hitch and we, my dad had to, screw holes in the bottom of his mom's CRV and we like put this hitch on it and we towed his motorcycle and our luggage out to San Diego and we left that day with 20 bucks. We got to Omaha and I had kayaks on top of our car and I put them on Craigslist the day before we left to try to get an extra couple hundred bucks. I was going to sell them and we just packed them on the car. We figured we'd take them with us. I had 20 bucks. Georgie was pissed because I didn't have no money and he had to support me and we get to Omaha and Matt Hansen calls me and he goes, Hey, I'll buy your kayaks for 600 bucks. And Georgie's like, all right, I'll turn around. And we turned around in Omaha. We went back three hours to Ames, got my 600 bucks. And then we hit the road again. We had a motorcycle and all of our stuff. And we just left to Oceanside and we didn't have a house. We, it took us several days to get there and it was the best trip ever. I mean, we were going through the Rockies and at one point we we're going 35 miles an hour in this, his mom's CRV because it wasn't meant to haul a trailer with a motorcycle and all of our shit. So we're 35 miles an hour. So we finally pulled off and like the San Rafael reef, it's right by the border of Utah. I remember exactly. And he was like, I'm going to just drive my motorcycle through the mountains because the car can't handle it on the, tra like the motorcycle on the trailer. And I was like, you don't even have a helmet. And it was super windy. And at one point it was snowing and raining 
and it wasn't like snowing enough to like it was just wet and he's just on his bike cold hauling ass on his motorcycle behind me or in front of me and i'm in the car thinking like this dude is insane uh, he doesn't even have a helmet on the freeway through the rockies i thought that was crazy but we got to oceanside and we stayed in a camp he would always wake up and like he was up at seven we all didn't have jobs so he would wake us up with him in san diego so we got our first apartment and me and Josh, we didn't have jobs, so he would wake us up, and then he'd make us go to Starbucks and, like, look for jobs while he was at work. And actually, the first week we got there, we stayed at the uh, um, El Camino Real campground for two weeks. And he was working at Vox, and he was going to school at Miracosta, and we were living in a tent, all three of us, me, Josh, and George. And we were on Google and Craigslist every day trying to get a place, and we found this woman named Anita. And I remember calling her, and she goes, Georgie goes, hi, I'm Georgie. And she goes, and I'm Anita, and I need a tenant. <laughs> and Georgie's like, great. Well, we need a place to stay. This woman had fake boobs. She looked, she's probably 80, but she looked 50. She's all Botoxed out. And Georgie's like, maybe if I give her a little TLC, she'll give us a little cheaper rent. And I'm like, no, not from you, buddy. So we meet this woman. We get this house. So we're at the campground. This house is huge. $1,800 a month. Georgie paid the first month's rent for five months because we had no money and no job. He was not letting us leave. And he's like, you and Josh owe me your, the thir a third of this. So he just kept racking up bills, you know. And when we got jobs, we would knock them off. We would ship at them. Paid him back. I finally paid him back. I went up to Northern California and trimmed a bunch of pot and I came back with a bunch of cash and I was so proud to give him all the money I owed him. It was like 3,200 bucks. It was that much. He helped me that much to get out there and I didn't even get a sponsor. I went out there thinking I was going to get all these sponsors and I didn't get a single one, but we filmed videos. We filmed every day. We skated every day and my favorite memories are just skating, working our asses off for clips and we would build, he convinced me to make lists of tricks we wanted to do at what spot so we would choose a day and we would go there on his day off and film as much as we could and try to get those tricks just shipped off that list when i lived with him in california this kid would get up work out make his coffee go to school get back home and be eating lunch by the time i'm waking up actually and i was just like and it it was like it hit you you're just like all right like i can do better like this guy can do all this stuff and just still just be going all the time. And then, you know, get home and put together an edit. Like, you know, we'd be getting ready to go out and go to the bars or whatever. And you hear a song sit there, keep going over and over and skip and go back and skip and go back. And 10 minutes later, he comes out and he's got this edit thrown together that he just did on Snapchat just for the hell of it. Like, you know, it was fun. So we were getting ready to go on a skate mission a Saturday morning. And we're all geared up, stop at a gas station to get some coffees and some waters. It's in San Diego. And uh, <laughs> we're standing at the cash register, and the clerk, this little, little uh, Latino girl, super cute, she's just like, you know, tells me my total. And George is like, we're going to go hit some trannies today, boys. I'm like, George, shut up. Like, like totally unaware that meant something different to other people than what it means to skateboarders. So it was like, I'm like, shut up. And he's like, we're going to hit these trannies. And the look on the cashier's face when I turned around was like mortifying. Like I wanted to get out of that gas station so fast. And so that's just always stuck to me. And like when we walk out, I like pointed out to him and he's like, oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. <laughs> like, And then he got his ride channel part and we helped him film that. And just watching him battle and work his ass off to get that video done was just insane. Because he would just come home with his elbows look like all, like, weirdest the elbows I've ever seen. Like, swellbo beyond belief. They're disgusting. And he just pushed through it and filmed the best shit I've ever seen anyone film. And he would go three times to get it. He would just go try a trick, try a trick, try a trick till he got it. And that trick would be off the list, and we'd go to the next one, the next spot. It was a riot. I mean, he pushed you. He was so funny and creative. Like, didn't even know he was artsy, like, you know, actually drawing and stuff. And you, you see that come out a lot, which is kind of fun to see. Um, 
I've lived with a lot of friends and learned to not ever want to live with those friends again. Um, I'd take Georgia back and live with him for the rest of my life. <laughs> he would always just like make, come up with these skits and they would always act them out like Halloween. They dressed up as old school skaters. Him and Tyler, they have a video on YouTube and it's funny as shit ever. He was always just so creative with his videos. He would think of them for weeks and then do them. And so one day he was leaving the house and I just downloaded Snapchat. I could afford like a nice smartphone. So I got Snapchat downloaded and it was right when it came out. And I remember going over the edge of the porch and like while he was going to work, like eight in the morning, he's all with his white t-shirt and his black dickies. Uh, I look over the edge and I go, hey, George. And I just take this rotten watermelon that we found in our fridge and I just spiked it on the sidewalk two stories down in front of him and it just sprayed him with watermelon and he just got soaked. He was like, you know, a car drives by and sprays you with rainwater. It's just like, and he just like, you fucking asshole. And he just turned around, walked back upstairs, punched me in the arm real hard and then got dressed and went back to work and he messaged me at lunch. He was like, I'm still fucking sticky, dude. Like, suck it and it was so funny and it was so unplanned it was a bunch of iowa kids uh tony lecount god it was how many people we have in there nine people in a three bedroom so tony and caitlin and tyler greaser jimmy kathy followed me out there on a whim and we we slept on the floor we also had three dogs christian christian cockrum also r.i.p um yeah and georgie so quite a few people trying to get by Iowans trying to learn how to live in SoCal. My girlfriend's sister ended up um, committing suicide when we were in Oceanside and we woke up and it was like the gnarliest morning I remember. Marcus had just gotten there with his girlfriend and we had, I mean we all that night, we all stayed up real late. Christian was there, rest in peace. Uh, Christian, Ty, me, Caitlin, George, Marcus, Michaela, Tyler. And we were all there. I mean, we were all partying that night. We went to bed. We woke up. We got a really gnarly phone call from Caitlin's mom and, or Caitlin's sister. And she told us what had happened. And um, I remember just like very numbly, like we just numb, you know, like holy shit, walking out to the living room. And I just see Marcus and Georgie kind of stand there like, because just they we woke up the whole house, and Georgie and Marks were just standing there in their boxers, like what the fuck is going on? And we're just I told him, and after I told him, you know, I break down. I let Caitlin have her space, and I go I come back out to the kitchen, and they had already collected their money together, without even us knowing like how much we needed to come back with. Georgie just had money for us. Marcus had his money that he had for his vacation, for us. And I didn't have any money. I was broke, living in San Diego, paying 1200 bucks a month to live. So we were just like poor. And we wanted to get, we had to get back. And they, they made it happen. Like, I mean, we would have made, had a way, but we didn't even have to. Like, they made it that stress free. Like, Georgie just, him and Marcus rounded up and, I was in the bedroom for maybe 30 minutes and I came out and we had enough money to come home and we stayed the week and it wouldn't have, I mean, it was just so, he just made it so easy. It was just like, here you go, man. You need to go home. You need to be there. I just cleaned out my savings essentially in his bedroom. Here you go. Same with Marcus. And that day we were home. We took a flight that day, that next day, that same 24 hours. We were in Iowa and we got to spend those really gnarly times with her family because they let it happen I mean they whatever you needed George would do for you like moving to California paying for that family emergencies like you were never you always had someone that exponentially meant more like you meant more to him than anything else if he could help you out he would and if he knew he needed to he would do it He's just, he was just there for us. And me especially. I mean, that man taught me so many lessons. Lee and I went out to California to visit him. You know, we had never really been anywhere together. And we're like, oh, let's go, let's go take a trip. So we drove out there and hung out with him and 
he took us around and we went skating and we just hung out, went to the pier and just played around. And then uh, on our way back, what is it, like two or three day drive? We were in Nebraska and Tony called me and he's just like crying and stuff. He's like, have you heard about Georgie? And I was like, no, what's up? I had moved back from Oceanside just recently. Um, I honestly, I think I just got a phone call from Bryce. And Bryce told me that he was at the skate park with him and he had hit his head. And, and he just said, you know, Georgie fell. He was skating a pool at a memorial event. Um, and uh, was, he's doing a backside air in a pool. And he just like kicked his board out. As he came down the transition to the bottom of the pool, the board got caught up in his feet. And so he slipped out um, and fell back and hit his head. And, um, you know, he just gave me the brutal details. It's like, you know, he's bleeding out of his ears. He's basically unconscious. Um, and I just wasn't processing the situation. I was like, he's going to be all right. Like, chill out. <laughs> and then, like, I still didn't process it for like a while, uh, for a minute. And I remember just like getting really numb, but at the same time, like I didn't want to completely break down because I didn't want that to be true. Like I knew he got hurt, but I didn't know like how serious it was. And then that night I called his mom and she said, it's fucking serious. And I was like, holy shit. And then he was like talking to me. He was like, we got to get tickets to go out there. And we were both working for Aunt Maud's at the time. And so, like, I was like, oh, shit. Like, this is actually serious. Like, I do need to go out there and fly out there and see him. And so I got a ticket. I think Tony got a ticket, but our boss wouldn't let both of us leave. So Tony let me go out there. The next week when Marcus flew out there with Michaela, I was like, I'm like four days away from my kid's birth. And I couldn't go. I couldn't go. I couldn't make it. And it broke my heart. I had just moved to Arkansas. Um, I heard about the ac accident. Immediately packed all of our stuff up. We drove out. Me, Jimmy, my roommate, Jay Nelson at the time, we all packed up and headed out to California on the last couple dollars that we had. We were like, we're going to set away what money we have for rent. It's like, I heard that he's in a coma and I'm like freaking out. So and like, it can't be real. That was this, that was this really like a wake up call for me. Cause I no idea what it meant to like be in a coma, like an induced coma and like how that affects people and the shit that he actually went through. Cause I didn't hear any of this, like this, the full story of what actually happened from what the doctors told me. Apparently hit the back of his head so hard that what happened is it like sh pushed his brain forward with such force that it damaged the front part of his brain. So like the back of his head wasn't even hurt, but the front part of his brain was forced so hard that it was damaged and it was swelling up. So they had to cut like a like a two by two inch piece out of his skull so his brain would protrude, so it wasn't like forcing it to like. You know, it, it was helping it to like relieve his swelling, and they were like, "God, it it was just so weird being there, like not knowing what I was getting myself into, and then all that was just like thrown on me." And I like immediately like had to like leave the room after all of this. It was heart wrenching to see him like broken but not beaten like but like he was he wasn't the same person he you know his brain was still trying to like he was trying to process everything because he had been in a coma for so long he he didn't know what was a dream and what was real and so to see him like not knowing you know some details it was it was hard to see but it was I'm glad that we got out there they like call us back in like go in and they're like telling us like there's a really small possibility that Georgie is going to live and we're just like no this is not like true this is like and they're like yeah well this is like the case and so we're just 
letting you guys know, like, if you guys want to keep us working at this, like, we're going to work as hard as we can to make this happen. And, like, Teresa was all for it, of course, like any of us were, but, like, she was, like, the person that was, like, in the, the, uh, the surgeon's face, like, yeah, like, you're going to do whatever you can to save my son. And so, like, that was, like, the first day I got there, and then the repeat of days that I started to show back up, we were just going and, like, sitting with Georgie, and he's just a vegetable, and, but his, his vitals were staying, like, up there, and so, like, there was still, like, a chance for him to live, and so we, I just, like, would just, like, sit there and talk to him for hours like this like try to get him to like remember stuff like they were telling me that like he would need to like be able to like function and like use his body again like he's, he's gonna have a hard time remembering how to do that so like I would be like George remember that switch flip you did like a couple of weeks ago like god that felt so good I bet like could you imagine what that felt like like in your right foot and like try to like like you know just like get that like mental like image of him like using his body and like I really think that kind of helped like him because like eventually he started like picking up his hands and like doing stuff like they would be like a tech deck or something and to hear from his doctor that he's improved in two days more than people he's had for you know multiple years and he's gonna make a full recovery and like that made us feel really good, but it was, it was hard. It was like a slow process. I was only out there for a week, but like I went from seeing him like be able to like just do this to like trying to like get out of bed and like sit up and like stand up and get out of bed. Like it got so bad to the point that like the doctors had to put mittens on his hands because he was like, he was pulling out his vitals and he was like getting out of bed like un harnessing himself and they even had straps on his arms and somehow he was getting the straps off his arms and pulling the gloves off <laughs> and like sitting up and trying to get out of bed like no one knew how he was getting out of bed like he was like literally locked in place like tied to the mattress with mittens on and he was still somehow getting out of bed and there is like super concerning because like he's not gonna be able to just take his whole full body weight right off the bat and he's gonna easily fall and if he falls he could injure his head like worse than it is and so like that was like it was exciting but it was also scary we we're like George slow down <laughs> like you gotta slow down man like we know you can do this like you just strong but like you gotta relax and like be patient too and he's such a stubborn person like even unconsciously like he was so stubborn right before i left the last day i left he did like he did a like a little like Ugh. and he was like marcus and i was like oh, fucking right george <laughs> like <laughs> it was so cool and then like yeah and then after I left, like, Teresa was like, he's been talking about some weird stuff, like, high school girls and stuff like this, <laughs> and I was just like, dude, what? Just, no. She's like, yeah, he's just saying some weird, bizarre stuff right now, and it's, it's crazy, because, like, when, when I left, I just, I heard about all the progress, and I was just like, God, so cool, and then he, he was at that point and he was ready to fly back to Ames and I was like all right like <laughs> we're meeting you at Des Moines airport and so we had like the whole crew go and dude that was incredible just to give him a huge hug one after another and to see his face light up and to see that spark and that connection um, be reignited that was so powerful it was awesome, just like seeing him come home and conscious, and like he was still, like you could see it, he was stoked on just everything. He was, they were walking 
down the hall in George's, like doing skateboarding tricks with his fingers on the the handrail, like on the wall. He's just like his rail is like, oh, there's a little gap in the rail to the next rail, pops an ollie next. Like it was, it was, it was awesome. Like he hadn't forgot who he was. He was still him. But I would also add that it was just very disconcerting and uh, to to see, you know, he had to he had to go everywhere wearing a helmet basically because of the um, concern of any sort of reaggravation of that head injury was potentially catastrophic. So to recognize that, you know, he had changed so much. You know, he still had his personality. Um, but he definitely changed. He definitely changed a lot. He didn't remember who I was. He, it was so fucked up. I remember seeing him and he was just talking to me. He knew I was Tony, but nothing, you could tell like no memory was really there of anything that we had done or been through, talked about. He was gone. And it was so fucking hard. He thought that I was having twin boys when I was having a little girl, he didn't, it wasn't him. It was his shell, but it was not his brain. It was super weird to look at. He, it was like he would just look at, it was like looking at, a, he looked at me like I was a stranger when I first saw him and it fucking hurt. And so he just hunkered down with his mom and he just raged on re rehabilitation. Like, he had to learn how to talk again. Um, I don't know how all that goes on, but he, I think you had to go down to Ankeny several times a week and just, they would teach him how to talk. And he had to like basically probably go through what we went through and, and learn how to read and talk and just basically starting from kindergarten and do it all over again. And just memory, like, exercises to get your memory back and how to retain things because for a while he couldn't remember anything you know it's a slow progression of like your brain heal healing and like you couldn't remember and then it, it, you just slowly build it i guess it's all beyond me some of the most profoundly important experiences that i shared with him was during that time just because uh you know, again, to just keep talking it up, his level of dedication, commitment, and motivation was uh, just phenomenal. He kind of, in a more sense, like became even more driven. Like, because one of the things me and Georgie shared a lot was like, you know, health and like fitness and all that. After his accident, like he was like like downing like smoothies every day and like eating vegan and like working out like bicycles runs like every morning i was just like dude you're like working harder than i am and you're trying to recover <laughs> like chill out dude <laughs> but he no that's like what he wanted to do and he did it best he and his mom actually they worked together to construct a harness in their basement of their house so that he'd be suspended from the ceiling while he was skating flat ground and he was relearning all of his tricks but there was no risk of him falling or hitting his head um that was incredibly powerful to learn you would like come to the park and hang out with us while we like we were skating and you could see that he wanted to skate so bad but he knew he couldn't yet until it was like safe for him to skate he actually came up with a sort of um, way to make his mom feel a lot more comfortable about him getting back on the board. You know, it's obviously he's got to wear a helmet, no question. He didn't really like the look of it, so he's able to like come up with this. I don't know where he got it, but it was a beanie that was actually a helmet. If you look at it, it looks like a beanie, but it's actually this really incredible helmet. He would wear that to the park, and then he just started getting back to work, you know? He learned everything again. <laughs> after going through all this, after basically dying, having to teach himself how to get back up, 
and just do it all over again was so inspiring and moving. I watched him like regrow his like frame of mind, like the, like all the plateaus, like you could tell, like he like crossed. And yeah, I think that's why Georgie started FLC is because like at that frame of where he was learning, he was still kind of coming to that end of like the period of when he was in high school and that's when he first started Focus Skate Shop. As it turns out, he probably got back on the board a little too soon because he ended up fracturing his ankle. So uh, then he's got a cast and he's got crutches after that. So he can't really skate and his focus is then, you know, kind of shifting away from skating to now being all in on the shop. That shop was going to be, that new building was going to be the FLC shop that we all, that was going to be it. Like that was the headquarters and FLC had been, I think it finally became this really big picture of like all of us homies. We're going to start filming shit. We're going to have our shop. We're going to have a team. We're going to make dope videos and it's going to be awesome. FLC started its flatland crew and it comes from being in the Midwest. It's flat here, you know, and that's where he dreamed up this flatland crew. And, uh, I mean, it was just, you know, we, we all have our in our minds that, oh yeah, I'm going to start like a crew or a company or like a, a, a clothing company or some, some whatever we all think about it from, we've all probably thought about it, but it works with him because you're like, oh yeah, whatever, what Georgie's doing some, like, I want to be a part of what Georgie's doing. Hell yeah. FLC is us, me, Marcus, this town, everyone down with George, Georgie's FLC. He started it. It was his, it's not an idea. It's not like, oh, we're going to call ourselves this. It, it became that. It was just, you know, subsect was subsect. Those were the Des Moines guys. But we were always just so tight, knit, knitted. We were just always together. And it became the flat lane crew. That was just us. We're from Ames. We're nobodies. But we all love skating and we all like hanging out. And that's, that's flat lane crew. Ames. Ames is the flat lane crew. I don't know. I believe there's like a lot more to it than just like the homies like here in Ames, but it's also like all the homies here in the Midwest. And for the most part, like that's like what Georgie like really wanted was for every like everybody like specifically like Des Moines crew and like Ames crew to like get along because i feel like at some point in time like when we we're younger kids there was so much tension with like just the stigma of like sh people who like were real street skaters and like park skaters and like ames kids got called out all the time for being park skaters even though like our park is like the roughest park <laughs> like to skate it's not really like a fun park to go and like just throw yourself around because you're gonna get beat up <laughs> doing that but we also like street skated a lot and so i don't know we always were just like dude fuck those des moines kids for like acting like they're so much better than us and i think like just like georgie like i don't know his persona like everyone just like we're like whoa that kid's like doing really cool tricks and so everyone just kind of like started liking him and I, I honestly don't think like that would be a like there would have never been like a change if Georgie like never like came to Ames and like started skating I feel like Des Moines kids and Ames kids would still kind of hate each other because that was definitely how it was like before he came I think that that idea or that moniker or that name got started with the intention of having it be inclusive, I think. It's just, it's your homies, it's your family, it's, it's your community. Um, it's, uh, it's just that radiating positive feeling of being around people that you love and doing something that you love every single day. There's two reasons I moved back from California and it's friends and family and 
I've, I don't know how I got so lucky to come in to this community, this skate community, like very late. Like I said, it was 18 when I really, you know, started and had a, had a couple drug years there for a little bit. So it didn't really until like 2021, but it just fully committed after that. And like, now I know I've always felt like I was like part of the crew that all went to high school together and hung out and, you know, they all have their nicknames for each other. And it was just like, how, like half the time they won't even remember that I didn't go to high school with them. <laughs> like, like that's a good feeling. So the crew is, it's a family. It's, I mean, you couldn't ask for better people. After his accident is like when he started the skate shop and like he never really expressed to me about doing any of that like and actually it was like vice versa like I was talking to him and I was like dude like I've been wanting to start a skate shop up and like do something here in Ames because he was out in Cali filming and skating for stereo and so like he was doing something good and I was like man I need to like do something with my life like fuck and then like after his accident is when he came and start or is when he like started up the skate shop and that was flc skate shop but that was gonna be it and you knew it that was his brainchild that was the other shop was his brainchild but he didn't remodel that shop he just bought whatever he could to put into it and then he made a shop happen with everything he could get that shop was on his mind for seven or eight years because his very first serious girlfriend Cassie Scigliano her mom owned that store and it was called Studio X in the entire three four years maybe longer or less I'm not quite sure that he dated her he wanted that shop for his skate shop and she loved Georgie and she was always like if I ever get rid of this building I will rent it to you for the skate shop and it became that was his concept when he had the shop up at battles and then it seven years later after getting hurt Coming back, that shop was up for rent, and he got it. He fucking got it. And that was, I remember him talking about that seven years, six years before. He wanted that building, and he got it. Fucking got it. It was amazing. I remember going in there, and they took out some shit. They put new shit in. They remodeled it. They repainted it. The basement was all cruddy. We set up, like, a weird wall in front of the bathroom so we could all poop with shoes, like a shoe wall, like shoe boxes so we could have our own little bathroom. It was so funny. And I just remember he called me one morning and he's like, he's like, dude, I'm exhausted right now. And he's just breathing hard. I was just like, what are you doing? He's like, man, sitting on the side of the road. I was trying to, I was trying to get to the shop. Couldn't get a ride. It's like, you, you tried to, to walk yourself on crutches over two miles to get to the shop. So that you could then continue working, doing manual labor, trying to get the shop open. Like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> like, I mean, I guess I wasn't surprised in a way, you know, because like that was just him. That's who he was. He's like, and I couldn't go any farther. Like my armpits, they're on fire. They're just rubbed raw from these crutches. And he's just laying there exhausted, you know. And I was like, man, I'll come give you a ride, whatever. He's like all good i think i got somebody on the way i'm just trying to get a backup plan but you know that again just speaking to that kid's level of dedication and commitment that was just unreal my girlfriend at the time and so like we just me and her had been together for about five years and we together like helped georgie like we're his at that time when like he has accent like we are his closest friends like hanging out with him every day and going out to the woods and he would just tell us stuff about how like he's like I don't know how to talk to any of these guys anymore like I just feel so like out of the loop and I was just like dude whatever man and like he would like tell us about like he's like I don't even remember like what music I listen to like what do I like anymore and like I was just like I would make playlists for him and like I was like, dude, she used to fucking play this shit all the time. It was the same shit I, like, listened to. So, like, dude, we're tight, man. <laughs> like, me and him just, like, hung out a lot in those times. And it was really cool. Like, like he got to meet, like, well, he already knew her. 
my ex, and um, we all were like vegan at the time, so we'd all like go to the store and shop together and stuff. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't talk like that to anybody else I, I knew, not my family, nobody. It, it just, they didn't get it, you know? I And even at that time, I had a very basic level of articulating my thoughts and feelings and all of these huge, uh, complex questions that I was asking about, you know, who am I, what am I doing here? I really couldn't delve into that with a lot of other people. But with Georgie, it's like, he got it. He understood it. He spoke the language. He saw me for who I was. He heard me and he understood. And that's something that I, I know that, you know, we as human beings, we, we need that. We need to feel that connection. That's how we're wired. We're social beings. And for me to have that level of social interaction with someone that I loved and I cared about so much, there's nothing else like that, you know. I get it in, in, a, in a different way with some of my friends today, but it's still not quite the same, you know. Basically had retained all of his tricks back that he had lost from his injury. He had basically had about everything back that I remember. I mean, he struggled, you know, he had little, but I mean, how do you not struggle a little bit? Like you're, I can't imagine, you know, but he was like doing all of his tricks and he was learning front foot impossibles and probably some other tricks. <laughs> so it was mind boggling to me, like learning new tricks. Like, and I don't even remember the, what the recovery period was, but it just does not seem like it was that long, you know, to be at, you know, it seemed it, to me, it seemed like a year prior to him learning front foot impossibles. He was in an induced coma. Like, I don't know if my timeline's correct. So less than a year from when he was in a coma, he was learning front foot impossibles. That's insane to me. From an injury, a brain injury that could have potentially ended your life. When we started filming videos and stuff, we started putting up like FLC at the park. Start, um, he started like connecting with a bunch of the people he had already worked with out in Cali. And was like, hey, like just trying to hook up the homies out here, like trying to start a skate shop and like which is really hard if you don't have a connection like that <laughs> you can't just like order stuff like he was doing like he had already had all this stuff before he even had like brick and border building and then yeah like i knew he was gonna do the shop and he was looking around for a while and thing that sucked about that is i wish i could have been there to see like because that when he, I guess when he was working on the shop, that was like when everyone started to see that he was becoming very fatigued and that he's having these uh, like little like seizures or like aneurysms, but no one was like knowing seeing these things because to no one was like educated on that. And I just so happened to be like at that point. I was like super inspired, especially after like seeing what had gone through him, like so fired up. And I was like, I'm doing this. I'm moving out to California. And you're coming with me. Like, I hope to see you out there in like a couple of months or shit like that. And so like I took off. He was setting up a board that someone was buying at the shop. This is something he's done hundreds of times. You know, it's, he can do it in his sleep. He gave a speech about it in, in high school. Um, an informative speech about it, you know? And so something that's so natural and fluid for him to have him stop completely, to kind of look down at his hands and, and, and you can see that there's a sort of disconnect happening and to have someone else take over for him and he would have to kind of just sort it out, you know, you give him a few minutes and he'd kind of come to you and, and be all right. But I, I was definitely not aware at the time of the severity or, or the significance rather of those moments where he said that he was stuck just because now in hindsight looking back those are serious indicators that you know due to the head injury there are serious ramifications there are definitely um problems you know there were definitely things happening to him physically that were not good that were affecting him 
uh, and, and the way that he functioned every day. But he was still fighting through it every second of every day. We were all hanging out at the shop. He just got a fresh order in. And it, there's so many questions being thrown at him at once. And he kind of just, he paused. Didn't matter how hard you try to get his attention. He, there was no response. It was just a blank stare into I don't know what. After the injury, I felt like him and I got closer and like we would, I would hang out at the shop with him a lot and like he stayed the night at my house. I just remember like that next morning driving him to the skate shop and gave him a apple and a banana and was like, all right, like I'll see you later. I'll probably come to the shop later or whatever. He was working on the skate shop. And we all went to the skate shop because he had a little, like, you know, a little soft opening or whatever you want to call it and just had some homies over and probably had some beers or whatever. You know, just super chill. And he was amped because when we went, when I dropped him off at his house, he got his first box of product for the shop or like another box, I think. It was something he was looking forward to getting. Maybe shoes. Like, he was like, oh, sweet, my shoes are here. You know, I helped bring him in and he, like, I don't know, maybe he did, like, wasn't helping me or he was like spacing out, so I just brought everything in for him, you know? But I didn't think anything of it. I don't remember, though, for sure. That could be a... I don't know. I could be making that up. I don't remember. But, yeah, I brought his stuff in, just set it down for him, and I just was like, see you tomorrow, dude, you know? And that morning, um, you know, I got out of bed, got into the shower, and... Uh, I got out of the shower to see that Teresa had messaged me. His mom had messaged me and she said that she hadn't heard from Georgie and that she was really concerned about him uh, because that was their routine. They check in every morning and her level of concern was, you know, even more apparent because I knew that she was out of town. She was at a family event and um, Georgie was by himself. So, um, I messaged her back and I just said, you know, if you haven't been able to get in contact with him, we've got to call in a wellness check. And uh, she said, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. She did it. And um, as soon as she called in that wellness check, I messaged her and I just said, I'm going to go over there. The next day I went fishing, probably hung over. <laughs> we went out late that night. So I was fishing at the river down here on 13th Street just went fishing. I fish all the time. And Derek called me. He's like, because Georgie was supposed to open up the shop that morning. He's like, dude, have you heard from Georgie, you know? I'm like, no, what's up? And he's like, I'll call you back. And I was like, that was weird. So like, I got really, this is where, this is where it's really weird. When Derek called me, I was like, that's really weird. But I like, felt like something bad happened. Like, really like, powerful. And like, I like grabbed my fishing stuff and I like, I, I grabbed everything and I started walking like really fast back to my car. Cause it's like, you know, quarter mile walk back to my car, like through the woods. And I started running and then I like threw all my fishing gear into my car and I just drove like 60 mile an hour down, down, uh, 13th street here. Cause that takes basically in like, and then, like, uh, yeah, I, like, just drove so fast, and I started crying, like, driving. So, um, I got my car, drove over here. It's right over here, Jarrett Circle. And uh, as soon as I rolled up to the house, you know, I saw, I saw an ambulance, and I saw two police cars outside. I didn't see anybody outside. No EMTs, no police officers. So I got out of my car, I walked up to the house, I got to the front porch, I saw that the front door was open, and um, one of the EMTs uh, walked out as I was approaching, and he just said, no, you can't go in, you know, you just need to wait right here, and I just, I nodded, I said okay, um, and then a few minutes later, um, a, a police officer came out and, you know, asked me who I was, I just told him, you know, I'm Derek, and he's like, well, how do you know Georgie? And I was like, he's my best friend. And then, 
you know, he goes, well, I'm sorry to be the one to have to tell you, but Mr. Tsushima has passed away. And then, um, yeah, everything changed. Everything changed in that moment. I, you know, I went into shock. I, I couldn't really speak. I wasn't crying. I was just, my mouth was open. I was breathing deep. I stood there for I don't know how long. You know, he, the police officer asked me, are you okay? I couldn't respond. I couldn't say anything. My mind was just reeling. It, it, you know, just obviously failure to comprehend the information that I was processing. Eventually, you know, he just kind of took me by the shoulder and, and you know, sat me down. And uh, outside of their house, they, they have massive maple trees right there. And uh, all, all I could do is just, is just look up at those trees. And uh, I just kept breathing. I watched the trees just swaying in the breeze looking at the sunlight and then uh, you know I still wasn't saying anything um, Nick Mulbauer eventually came over because I called him too and just told him what was going on and like sorry and he's just I like pulled him and there's like fucking cops and an ambulance and shit and like, because his mom lived in a cul-de-sac and like, there's just paramedics and I'm like, geez, what's going on? It's just really weird because it's like, I felt it. And I was like, our good friend Derek was there and he's sitting on the grass. And uh, he's obviously very concerned and came over and he uh, walked over to me as I'm sitting down and uh, he's just asking me, you know, Derek, what's going on, man? He's so, he's, he's terrified. He's like, just sit down. I was like, okay. I'm sitting down, I'm like freaking out, but I'm like, all right. I'm trying to relax. And he was like, I was like, Derek, what's going on? He's like, Georgie died. I was like, are you kidding me? I look at him and I say, Nick, you were probably the last person to see Georgie alive, you know, because I knew that Nick was the one that gave him a ride home the, last, the night before. And then Nick just, Nick lost it. I was just tripping, like, it was super gnarly. And I was just, like, pacing, like, running circles and, like, just rolling in the grass, like, like for real. Like, it's just so crazy, you know. It's just really weird. You know, it's just sobbing uncontrollably. Like, and for me, my my emotions were, were still very far away at that point. I was still very much in a mental state. I was in shock. I was still just trying to process the fact that my best friend was in that house 20 feet away from me. But the, to, to realize that my best friend at 25 years old, after just going through this miraculous recovery, had, had just died. I mean, it was so disconcerting. It was so disorienting. It was so surreal. It was absolutely fucking bizarre. I just remember it's, it's so... I just, I remember rolling in the grass, like, I'm, like, freaking fetal position, like, just freaking, like, crying my brains out, <laughs> like, and I, I just remember, like, that's, like, I, I know, like, that's, like, the worst pain I've ever felt in my life, like, sadness, you know. But then, I took it upon myself to call a handful of people that I knew that, or at least I felt that they had to know. That day I got a missed call from Derek. I didn't answer it, so whatever. And then I have my boss knocking on my door. They called the restaurant. 
And they go, this guy named Derek's on the phone with you. And I just grabbed it and I hung up. Because my dad has really was really sick. And my dad has cancer, had cancer, and now he's not doing the best. But but we I always knew my dad was going to be not doing well. So when I live far away, every time I get a phone call from someone, I do always give me a little hesitation to answer. And then I was like, fuck, my dad's dead. My dad died. My dad died. Caitlin, I can't call him back. Caitlin's like, you have to call him back. Call him back. So she's sitting there like rubbing my back. I am just doing this. I remember just doing this like, fuck, I don't want to call him back. And then I get another call from him. And I answer it. And he's like, Tony, this is going to be the worst day of your life. I go, is my dad? He's like, no, George, he's on a stretcher right now in front of me being brought out of his house. He's dead, dude. He's fucking dead, dude. And I just... Boom, like tunnel vision. And I just drop the phone. And I'm just standing there like, Kaylin, Kaylin, Georgie's dead. And I just remember like, just crumbling. And it was the most unreal feeling I've ever had. I've never felt that in my life. My life, I've never felt that. Like afraid, I was like afraid, like, it was scary. Nothing was going to be the same ever again. And it wasn't, it hasn't. But that was it. That was that call was just like just being nailed into the ground and you couldn't help it. And you couldn't do anything about it. And then you just had to walk back to your house and take care of your kid and go to work for 10 hours and just pretend like that wasn't real. But it was. And it was fucked up. It was the most insane phone call feeling. Still, I can, I mean, when I think of that call, I just, my hair stands up, my body just, I get hot. It's like a, you can, it is a feeling I've never felt in my entire life. As I was leaving Yellowstone, like, Derek calls me and I couldn't get a hold of him for a while because the mountain reception and I just knew something was like up like that I didn't know I was like is this Derek like telling me that his dad passed away or like this is this sounds serious and so like I finally pulled off of Schiller and got some reception and called him and like before I even spoke like I just, like the energy that was coming from that like it just flipped that switch and I was like this is about George. <laughs> and yeah, and that's when I found out that Georgie passed away. And me and my ex, she drove the entire way, like, did not stop from that point that we're at, from like Yellowstone all the way to Ames. And it fucking poured rain the entire time. It was fucking so crazy it was just weird it was such a trip I had to work a 10 hour day right after hearing that he died nobody in that fucking building would cover my shift and I just lost my absolute best friend I couldn't even talk I was just hysterically crying during my entire shift I kept cooking food wrong I kept I, I would I, at one point I remember just falling to my knees at the fryer and just like and Yvette, this lady, Yvette, comes up to me and she's like, why are you here? And I'm like, no one will work for me. She's like, fuck this, dude. Fuck that. You need to be home. But I also remember, like, the night he passed, like, the night after he passed away. Like, I remember waking up in the middle of the night and I was just so upset because, you know, you like, you're sleeping, you know? And then you wake up and you're like, this is real life. And Georgie's like dead like he's still gone like it's real and you're just like i just remember like it just i just remember like coming out of like being unconscious and just being conscious again just like that's the first thing i thought of and i just started bawling again because i was just like holy crap like this is real the next day i woke up and i just remember like that is this is real this is fucking real how what? Why? What? 
what? Like, it wasn't real until I find, like, the whole day was like, I was a zombie. I was just moving through the, going with the flow. And I had to do, you know, go th through it and get through it. But I don't know how I did. I mean, it was so fucked up. It was crazy. It was pretty fucked up. It made a lot of us appreciate our friendship exponentially more. Um, it, it, it definitely made it way easier to appreciate as grown-ups the time that we get to spend on skateboards together and forget about being grown up. And he had that infectious, I guess, aura about him where like, you're going to have fun, even if you're having a bad day, if you're skating with him. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that's something that a lot of us have learned throughout the years. Like you're not 25 anymore. Like you can't skate like you used to, but you still do certain things and it's, it's worth the suffering, you know, cause that's what a lot of skateboarding is. You don't, you don't win all the time. <laughs> so yeah, I guess just the appreciation and not giving up on that stuff and trying to take a positive note from all of it. It was way tight. We, when he passed away, we all stopped chilling. We get together on his birthday and when we, you know, we plan shit now before it was like inevitable inevitable you you hung out we were together all the time skate park was nightly filming was daily if you wanted to if you wanted a day off they were still going um the group is so tight i mean we are still we are insanely tight now we were the same like just as tight but now it's like we know that we lost george and that it could happen to any of us at any time. So we need to stay as close as we can. It made us all a lot more sentimental, close. We, uh, there's a lot more love yous and hugs going on. We're closer with a lot of people that we, we never would have, I mean, we weren't like, you know, enemies with them by any means, but like now like people that you just kind of knew just through skateboarding, like everybody knows everybody. You go to Des Moines, Everybody's cool with the Ames guys, which was kind of unheard of growing up. It was kind of a click click thing. So, I don't know. Yeah, it just drew everybody closer. Georgie was the guy that was going to be my kid's uncle her whole life. He was going to be there for me my whole life. I was going to be his best man. He was going to be mine. Like, we were supposed to be together forever. But it doesn't happen like that. Life isn't like that. It's not all rainbows and fucking butterflies. And you have to acknowledge that and then take that to your friends you still have now. You know, losing them, you have to go to your friends now and you have to hug them every time you see them, every time you leave them. You, you, you have to. It's, you have to. It's, it's made me love my friends more. That's for fucking sure. Life goes on. You know, I'm fine. I'm great. Like, it's not going to, like, it's not stop me from doing anything like Georgie passing. But, like, when he passed away, it just, it hurt really bad. And, like, that, that lasted. Just yesterday, I'm putting up pictures and just bawling like a baby, man. My room. Because, like, you look at a photo, you can, like, smell him. You can see him. You can, his hats especially, they were the grossest fucking things. They, were, they weren't even hats. They were just crusty little, I don't know. It was just so gross. They stunk so bad. It was so funny. We would just get in the car and be like, Ugh! like oh, get that fucking hat. And then like you'd put it in the trunk sometimes because, god damn it. It was just so funny. Everyone says life is so fragile, but really, like, it's fragile, but in the end, it's fucking cold. And it's you're not as important as you feel. You, you can go at any minute, and it's it's a true thing. And watching it firsthand, two of the closest people to me, it makes me love my friends more now, the ones I still have, because you never fucking know. And losing them was fucked up. I mean... This is a time to rally. This is a time to carry momentum, and this is a time to move forward. 
And I basically said that FLC isn't going anywhere. FLC is here to stay. You know, we are here to continue doing what we do best. And um, the response and reaction um, that came in the following weeks and months and even years after his passing has been tremendous. Even without Georgie, FLC was just as strong, if not stronger, because of the fact that I felt as though, for me personally, it was my responsibility um, through having one of my best friends pass away and having it be such a catalyst for change in my life and within our community and for everybody else to know that okay, this is my responsibility to embody and exemplify the, the person that he was, the things that he believed in, you know, how can I continue that out into the world, into what I'm experiencing? And so to see not only, or to recognize that change within myself, to see that change happen within so many other people in our crew, that's when I knew that like, it was just strong. It always was strong, you know. It's 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 not so much about any one individual, you know. It's it's about the group. It's about the collective, the community as a whole. So, I would say it changed a lot, you know. Obviously, to not have him around, but to know that he's never really gone. He's always there, you know. We're always, you know, we're always living through what we experienced with him, you know, constantly, every second. That is his, his smile. Yeah, like he had a smile that was just like, dude, everything's gonna be okay. Like, you know, like an innocent, like, animal, you know? <laughs> like your, your cats or your dogs, like, they're not causing no harm, <laughs> ever. Yeah, he had that warmth in his smile. Everything about George is to be missed. Everything he did, all his traits. It was something everybody needed that didn't know. I don't have a single friend like I did with him. I don't at all or like just from phone calls to like when we go out to dinner um, I just miss him I miss everything about him his stinky hats his small feet his fucking gross looking elbows I just miss a connection with someone that you don't have with anyone and that was him for sure I have friends but they are not like him they they will never be that man taught me things that my fucking dad should have taught me. He taught me a lot. And my, you know, he was, he was a huge impact. He has a huge impact on me. And, you know, I think about him all the time. I'm not doing as good as I'd, you know, want if he was still around. But I definitely, uh, I live a lot for him. I talk, my daughter knows about him. She's five, and she talks about him all the time. She doesn't even remember him, but she always talks about Georgie's not here with us, and he's with Ellie, our dog, and she knows about him. Um, I'll never not talk about him. I just miss him. I miss him, how he loved my family. He liked my parents. He liked my sisters and my brothers. He was just a fucking real friend that you don't really have very many of and that's what I miss most about him his just how warm he was for sure I just miss him I miss his smile and also I just it sounds kind of weird but like he was, he, you know, I think he had sort of developed a reputation of being committed and throwing himself at whatever he's trying, you know. 
being willing to sacrifice that was something that i kind of missed that was like to see that level of dedication that level of commitment that level of sacrifice i miss that man i i see that in some ways in the world in, my, in some ways in my life right now but then that was so apparent that was so real that resonated so much with me shit yeah i love you i miss you thanks for everything like thanks for helping the community and bringing all of these different people together and making what was already there even stronger like couldn't have been a better person in the world to do that wouldn't wouldn't choose anybody else in the world to have been that guy like irreplaceable I miss you and I love you that's about it it was a huge part of this community more than anybody knows outside of our community of uh, skaters. This is what made who we were. I miss him every day. I would probably talk to him about uh, getting some clips, <laughs> going skating. I don't know, have anything specific I would say to him, but I just want him to know that I still love skating. Thanks to him. <laughs> and his peanut butter coffees that he loved making. Just that I love him, and uh, I'd say thank you for like uh, getting me back into skating. Um, I love you. I fucking miss you every day. There's not a day I don't think about you. Yeah, thanks for all your inspiration. I would. Oh man, I think just thank him for just being so good to me and to my friends and my family and for all, everything that he taught me and gave me, the opportunities that he didn't have to give me, but for some reason he wanted to. I'd give him a big fucking hug and a kiss and just thank him for pushing me, arguing with me when I needed to be argued with, telling me straight to my face when I was fucking up. I just miss all of it. And I would tell him, uh, you left an impact on all of us that we can't repay you. We cannot give it back to you, but we're gonna, we're gonna try to do our best with you not here. And I wish you could meet my daughter. I wish you could get to know her because, I mean, when we found out, I I think I was more stoked that you were going to be your uncle than anyone. I miss you. I love you. Uh, I always think about you. Daily. Songs I write are usually somehow about you. Uh, I love you. And I'll never forget you. Brother love. Brother fucking love. Just, I love him and I miss him. I mean, uh, I don't know. I'm, uh, I hope he's out there and I hope I can like be with him again someday or like experience whatever it is that comes after life. If there's any one thing I want to believe, I want to believe that it's not just the ending because there's a lot of things you experience in life that are amazing and a lot of people that are amazing and I just hope that that we get it all be together again and like Georgie dying like I want to believe that I will see him again or whatever experience is is 
being his him his essence whatever i want to be around that again you know if i could say something to him right now it would just be to just tell him that i love him (laughs) to just To just tell him that I love him and that I appreciate everything he ever did to be the person that he was. I appreciate it so much. Just to say that I love you, I appreciate you, and thank you.